right. Here we go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this month's webinar, Touring Quintus's Roman Britain. It's presented by the North American Cambridge Classics Project and sponsored by Cambridge University Press. I would like to give Natalie Roy a very, very warm welcome as this evening's guest presenter. Natalie teaches Latin, Roman technology, and myth makers at Glasgow Middle School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She is a national board certified teacher. She develops and teaches lessons that center STEM in the classical world. And this work has garnered her the American Classical League's 2023 Charles Humphreys Innovative Pedagogy Award. In the spring of this past year, Natalie was honored as a worldwide finalist in Cambridge University Press's Dedicated Teacher Award Contest. Through this competition, she was able to advocate for her LGBTQIA students. And this past summer, she took a trip to England and did not want to return home. She is super excited to talk to us this evening about Roman Britain. And we cannot be more delighted to hear all about this. As we know, many of us teachers teaching this Unit 2 material find this uh, somewhat challenging at times and, and sometimes not all that interesting. So I think what <laughs> she brings to the table will hopefully change everyone's minds about Roman Britain. We are recording the webinar this evening. Uh, we'll post it on the NACCP website in a few days. And if you need a professional development certificate, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, email us, training at cambridgelatin.org. And we'll post that again at the end. And that is if you need a professional development certificate. So let's welcome Natalie and tell us all about your experiences this past summer in Roman Britain. Sawete omnes. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm calling this presentation Roman Around uh, Quintus's Britain. I thought y'all would enjoy that little that little wordplay. Um, if you need me after this presentation, uh, please feel free to email me or find me on any of these links um, here. I also post these slides so that you have um, hot links to these things. For now, I've posted in the chat a website that I created to kind of um, solidify in my own mind my learning from this trip, which was so wonderful and momentous for me and my own learning. So I hope you'll have a look. We'll look at that a little later, but I just wanted you to have it um, now to kind of peruse as, as you wish. Um, I can't, I would be remiss without putting in a plug for this amazing experience that uh, my friend Bob Halsha Simmons and I are going to be hosting at his university, Monmouth, in Illinois this coming summer uh, in July, July 8th to the 19th. Uh, we got an amazing grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to run a K-12 Summer Institute on the Ancient Olympics. And um, it's not just about the Olympics, but it's also about the daily life going on in ancient Olympia with all the, hand, the um, you know, the people who lived there, the people who sold things there, the people who prepared for this event. Um, and so anyway, we're calling it a hands-on history and there's going to be lots of experimental archeology, span sports reenactments, all kinds of stuff. Application process begins on December 15th. So if you're interested in maybe applying for this experience, please reach out and keep your eye on social media to find out more on that date. So a lot of people asked, you know, um, you got funding to travel, why, why choose Britain? And here are some of my answers. Um, I had already been to Roman uh, site, sites in Italy and Greece. I didn't feel like I needed to numerous times. You know, I'm, I'm sure you, if maybe you've taken students, you've been on your own. I felt like I had done those and I, I was done. Um, there's no language barrier. I, 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 every time, I don't know about y'all, but every time I went to Italy, I always felt really bad that I hadn't studied Italian enough. 
um, the few little things I had learned or the attempts I had made just didn't get me feeling like I really connected with the people. Um, increasingly, every time I visit Rome, I, there are so many pickpockets, although someone has told me that that ha is a problem that has kind of been relieved. I hope so. It always made me feel uh, very nervous when I was there. And the real reason, here's the real reason, and I wish he were here. Um, James Watson, who is a British um, Latin teacher, he's also on the Cambridge Latin course um, team. He did this little presentation at ACL. It was the summer of 2019, I think. And his presentation was all about visiting the sites of Quintus's Britain. And so that really got my mind turning like, oh, wow, you know, I could really go to these places and I'm sure there are a lot more. So uh, I really thank James for that. And every time I talk about this trip, I, I do mention him. Um, so anyway, this is a picture of me on Hadrian's Wall. This is an area right near um, Berardus Wall. I'll talk about that later, but it's a it's one of the, I think it's the longest uninterrupted stretch of the wall that exists now. So it, it's a very famous site. You, you'll see people take their picture here with good reason. So if you're looking for funding for a trip like this, you might not know that there is funding available. Um, if you're a newer teacher, um, lots of these organizations have funding for teacher travel. I was lucky enough to get funding from the National Latin Exam, um, which was amazing. And um, I, definitely before you even think about going on a trip like this uh, that you're paying for, look into some funding. Uh, your school could even help you fund some of this trip. So that this link here is just, you know, easy access to all of those things that um, you might want to investigate. And this is one of the amazing mosaics at um, Colchester. So this was my itinerary. Um, we started in, we landed in London, we flew to London, but we didn't stay in London. We uh, immediately got into our transportation and headed to the southeast area of um, England. So you, you see there my little start uh, arrow. We then made kind of a giant counterclockwise kind of oval <laughs> around England and ended up back in London to end our trip. Um, in a way that was a mistake and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later, but always keep your eye on when museums are open and the things that you want to see. my One of my biggest disappointments for the trip was that the Roman rooms were closed. The Roman galleries at the British Museum were closed on the one day that we planned to go to the British Museum. So it was a little uh, upsetting. Uh, it, there was nothing anyone could do. It, there was extreme heat at the time in London and they closed the galleries because of course there's no air conditioning in the British Museum. And they just felt that it was too hot for people to be in those galleries. So I was very disappointed. I did get to see the Romano British rooms. Those were open, but I did not get to see the, the Roman ones. So I was a, very disappointed. So I guess some advice here would be to always have a backup plan. You know, we saved the British Museum literally for the last day that we were there. And so that was a little bit, you know, got me. <laughs> Won't happen again. All right. So how we got around, we've gotten so many questions about this. Um, this is what we chose to do. This was me and my husband. Um, through the past few years, uh, being the teacher of the year for Louisiana and some other speaking experiences, I was able to save up money so that my husband could come with me on this experience and pay for his trip. Uh, he's a reporter, a journalist. So just like teachers, we, we, neither one of us is making the, the money to go on, on trips like this. So I had saved money hoping that he would be able to come with me. And he was. So we decided that we were going to be brave and we were going to rent a camper van and do all the driving ourselves. And when I tell you this was an amazing experience, it was. It was crazy scary, I'm not gonna lie. Um, if you've ever been on British roads, you know that they are tiny, <laughs> T-90. Um, 
and they all, almost all bridge roads have these tall hedges on either side. Um, and they're really, British roads are really just one lane. <laughs> it's like uh, one lane of traffic. So that was a little uh, crazy. We got used to it quickly. I was the navigator. My husband was the driver. Uh, driving on the other side of the road was also an adventure. But we absolutely loved staying in this camper van. It was so easy to have all of our stuff in one place and not have to move it from hotel to van to car, whatever. It was just a really nice experience. We also liked the, the campgrounds where we stayed. They were full of young children and families and just felt really, really homey and, um, and fun. So we were super sad. <laughs> and I highly recommend getting your own car if possible. If you're brave enough to do it, absolutely do it. There were so many strikes before, during, and after our trip of public transportation workers. So I, I seriously don't know how we would have gotten around to some of these places if we had not had our own transportation. Unfortunately, um, we ended up, <laughs> our, our van ended up breaking down uh, on a very busy highway. And these wonderful policemen were nice enough to come and get us. Uh, the van, the van's clutch broke down. The van was literally five years old. And I think we, the clutch just gave out. It was nothing that we did and nothing that our van owner did. So these policemen, this was a whole experience in and of itself, just meeting these policemen and talking to them. They were so nice. Um, I think my husband still emails the guy on the, on, on the right. Um, he really just connected with him. It was, it was a nice experience. Sadly, it lost us a whole day of travel. And for that reason, we missed a couple of villas in the Southern region, but I'll get to that later. So after that, we just rented a car and sadly had to stay at hotels. We didn't mind the hotels. We just really missed the campgrounds. And if I ever get to do anything like this again, I will definitely go back to a camper van. So now I'm just going to kind of go through some of the sites that we saw, but I'm, I'm going to try to align them with um, the chapters from the CLC. So stage 13 is called in Britannia. And if you recall, in Britannia is all about <clears throat> the, the Romans kind of getting to Britain. So one of the first sites we, we actually saw was Dover Castle. And um, I, I put these little red arrows on the map so that you can kind of see, you know, I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> I was not familiar with all of the, the different towns and cities and areas and counties of England until I really started to study it. And so here's where we're starting with this red arrow. And so uh, the White Cliffs of Dover are kind of like uh, this iconic symbol of England. And you can kind of imagine Julius Caesar, you know, or that's at least what I was imagining when I was there was Julius Caesar like sailing up to this and seeing this gigantic, um, these white cliffs, beautiful limestone cliffs. And um, with this blue sky in the background, of course, I don't know, at the time of year that he was probably there, the skies maybe weren't as blue. But then we also have Claudius, of course, uh, I imagine seeing this as well. Um, the little town of Dover is a cute little uh, quaint town right along the cliffs and I just thought the little buildings and houses were so cute. <laughs> um, one of the sites that we saw here was near um, the Dover Castle. So this right here is the oldest lighthouse in England. It was built by the Romans in the first century CE. And it was originally 24 meters tall, which I always have to triple that in my mind. Like, you know, it's, it's nearly 60 feet tall. And there's my six foot husband for reference. And um, obviously this building still stands. It eventually became the bell tower for St. Mary in Castro, um, this thousand year old uh, church built on the foundations of the original Roman fort or excuse me, the fort that was um, built by the, um, as protection from the Danes, by the Anglo-Saxons. 
Um, so yeah, so this is like the back of the uh, lighthouse. And of course, this is the view <laughs> from um, standing where the lighthouse was. You can see kind of the, the quay in the distance. And as I was looking at this, of course, I was thinking about the Romans, you know, rolling up to this place and um, seeing it for the first time. So we next uh, visited one of my favorite places in Britain, and um, this is called Richborough Roman Fort, which is right near Dover Castle. This is often called the gateway to Roman Britain. This is where Claudius landed his troops, or near here is where Claudius landed his troops in 41. And it's a beautiful site. Um, there at um, the fort, they built, the Romans built this monumental arch. Uh, the remains of it, only the very base of the um, arch is still there. But um, this newly uh, organized little museum that's attached to the fort had this um, little rebuild to see. So it gives you some idea of the scale. This is outside um, the fort. Um, these walls, he talked about these walls, how unique they were um, built up with, um, with earthenware, um, grass and sand and whatnot. We arrived in England at a very beautiful time of year. Um, this was in June that we went early June, the first two weeks of June, and everything was just beautiful. The sky was blue, beautiful weather, not too hot. This is one, um, this here is a structure that they rebuilt to give an idea of what the Roman um, structure would have looked like. So this is not original. They did, however, um, the tour that we, we went, we actually did a little tour for this and the tour guide was telling us how they built this using ancient Roman techniques, or at least they tried to as much as they could. So we thought that was really interesting. Uh, the arrow is pointing to the foundations of that monumental arch that I was just talking about. And I'm actually standing, as I'm taking this picture, I'm standing in that um, structure. So that's looking out from the structure and that's the monumental arch. And this arch, uh, the guide was telling us, was like the Romans way of saying, you know, you enter the Roman world here. Um, it was their way of saying, like, we have, you know, officially conquered Britain. This is the entrance into that land. All right. So moving on to stage 14, we've got Apud Salium. And um, although I was talking to... Um, Caroline about this um, from the Cambridge uh, Latin Course Project. Uh, she was telling me, I asked her, well, you know, is there a specific site that the House of Salwis was actually based on? And she told me something that I had never heard before, which was, and actually Lisa Hay told me this, that it's based on a place called Angmering Roman Villa. And I put an arrow near where it is now. Um, the site is actually covered now with dirt. It was in a field, uh, was excavated and studied, and a report was written about it. And if you want that report, ask me. I, I think I have access to it still. But after they were done excavating the site, they just covered it up so that you can actually go today. So, however, oh, and oh, actually, look, here's the report linked here, okay? And here's what the site originally looks like. Or what they excavated. But since that doesn't exist, I wanted you to be able to see something that they based, I don't know if y'all remember, but the videos they made of Sawius and Rufilla having their big argument, you know, in stage 14, which I love that argument. Um, it was actually filmed in this reconstruction of a townhouse, a Roman townhouse in a place called Rocks that are Roman city or ancient Wiraconium. And so that's where that location is. And of course I was fortunate enough to visit. So I want to show you some pictures. 
This is Wiraconium. It was the second largest Roman town in Britannia and it was known for its luxurious bath. Um, more and more, and I'll talk about this a little later, um, the theme for me for this trip was baths. Um, they were literally everywhere and for obvious reasons, right? You can see why the Britain, ancient Britons and people, ancient Romans living in Britain would have loved warm baths. So this was the town and it was of course known for its thermi. You can probably tell that I'm standing in front of a hypocost or one of the hypocausts for this giant bath in the, in the center of the city. Uh, here we have the reconstructed townhouse that was used in the videos of uh, Rafilla and um, Sawius. So I'm gonna kind of go through what we saw when we visited this house. I think this is the north face of the house. And then here was the little um, outdoor patio area. And this is looking in toward the house now. I love the choice of colors, I'm trying to match ancient Roman colors. So you may recognize this room. I think it was featured in one of the videos kind of a small little um, reception room. Uh, here, I just love the little um, painting detail on the wall of the black and white dots. And in this room, they used it to experiment with some different building techniques. So you see kind of a uh, plaster on that left-hand wall. And beyond that, some different brick type works and then a thatch work on the right. And of course, some bipedales uh, on the floor. Probably um, they were experimenting with a hypocost type heating system. A little bedroom. which with all those holes in the wall must have been very cold. And then I just love this view of looking into the little garden patio area with the house in the background. And moving on to stage 15, we've got King Kagi Dubnus. Um, as you can probably guess, um, we went to where Claudius's temple was located. Um, Claudius, of course, being the emperor who made him a client king. And um, it was really interesting to see this location. Here's what the temple probably looked like in ancient times based on the base of the temple. And of course, we know this was famously destroyed by Boudicca in 60. This is what was built on top of that temple eventually, Colchester Castle, an Anglo-Saxon structure. And to see the foundations of the ancient temple, you have to go on a tour that takes you uh, into the bowels. <laughs> I know everyone loves that word, bowels of um, the building. And so here we see um, kind of just a, a depiction by an artist. This was on the tour. They had these beautiful placards that you could, uh, that helped you to envision what it would have looked like. And then here's an actual picture that I took of the castle. And to go underneath, you actually had to take these little dinky stairs all the way down that were, it was kind of scary, honestly. Um, and it, they didn't allow us to take many pictures, so I don't have pictures of that. But this is where Claudius's temple was, kind of cool. Here's a reconstruction or model, actually it's a little model of the temple. It's gigantic, as you can see. And then inside um, the Colchester Castle is actually a museum. And it's not just a, a, a museum dedicated to Roman 
fine. So there's lots of other things there. But I just wanted to, to uh, highlight a couple of the things that I really enjoyed seeing while I was there. And one of those is this beautiful um, Barbatine cup, probably a drinking cup, with this gladiator mo motif on one side. And I'm saying goodbye to my daughter. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Love, love you. you. Okay. And then um, on the other side, we've got these beautiful hairs running from and deer running from dogs. I just love this cup. I remember seeing in our textbook every, you know, every year I teach this, this chapter and we talk about these slave chains and here they were um, in the museum. So it was a really, um, it was sad to see, but it helped me so much better to understand. And I'm sorry for my camera phone in the, my phone camera in the picture, but that's the best I could get. Most everything was behind glass. So very difficult to photograph. All right, so in this chapter, we also talk about Boudicca and you can't go to London without seeing the statue of Boudicca, which of course we did. Uh, I was very uh, disturbed by seeing this statue, very disappointed, I should say. Um, it's located right outside a tube station. And you literally get off the tube, walk up the, up the steps, and there she is. <laughs> so it's kind of, um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but um, she was beautiful to see. Here she is from the side. And you may know this statue was, is a bronze statue started, oh, I forget the artist's name, but um, it was started in the 1850s. It took him decades to complete uh, with the help of his son. And it was finally, I think, um, mounted and put up. Oh, here I have his name, Thornycroft. Uh, finally installed in 1902. And so if you look right here, you'll see where the people are coming off of, out of the tube there to the right. And there she is, like, you know, she's literally right there um, on the Thames, right across the, the, the Thames River from um, the London Eye and right across the street from Big Ben. So I feel like she gets ignored, but she was great to see. And then moving on to stage 16, we have in Aula. Um, and of course, we're going to see the, the palace of Kagidovnes or Tagidovnes, if you're going with the more modern uh, pronunciation. So um, this was a really interesting site. It, it was supposed to be in conjunction with a couple of other sites. Unfortunately, if you move the, the red arrow a little bit over to the right, that's where our van broke down. So we, like I said, we lost a whole day of seeing a couple of other sites around Fishbourne and spending more time at Fishbourne. I really wish we had had a, a chance because it's got a really juicy museum. It's a great museum that's attached to it. And the site itself is, is magnificent. It's really beautiful. But it's also located like in a neighborhood. So that was really uh, interesting to see. If, you, if you've ever showed this to your students on Google Maps, which I highly recommend, you can see literally how the palace is kind, it was kind of cut into. Um, only half of it really <laughs> has been excavated. The rest of it is literally under a neighborhood, a residential, a modern residential neighborhood. So it's kind of jarring to see modern houses um, literally right next to uh, this site. And as we were driving into the parking lot, we could see children like walking for field trips to the museum. And I just, it just makes my heart flutter thinking about, <laughs> wow, uh, if my school were right next to uh, something that I taught every day, it would just be so fun so interesting so such a different way of life living in a, in a more in a younger country uh you'll see a lot of these little things all over museums they're uh, engagement um methods for kids that visit um all in british children are expected to do a whole unit on the romans which of course makes sense and uh 
being it was June when most students are just about to get out of school, we were like in Maine, um, you know, prime um, field trip time. So we saw a lot of little kids visiting the museums and we had so many teachers. I felt so bad. We had so many teachers um, apologizing to us um, for, you know, being there when the kids were there, having to endure the kids. But I really, I really loved seeing it. I thought it was really nice. So here's a famous model that is featured in our textbook. And again, sorry for the bad photography with the light there over the, the main entrance. But again, when something is behind glass, it's really difficult to, to photograph. So you may know that um, because of the mosaics, uh, they don't want people walking on the mosaics. So they've built these, these beautiful wooden ramps or walkways all through the site so that you can look over these little banisters and see the, the mosaics. Here's one of my favorites. And I couldn't believe I was actually seeing this one in person. And then of course the Cupid on the dolphin. And this was a neat little experience I had. <laughs> they had these helmets you could try on. And, and while I was trying on the helmet, I was talking to the lovely man to my left there. He told me the most amazing story. And this, this gives me hope about my future <laughs> as a retiree, eventually. He told me that he, for decades, uh, taught Latin in the area um, of the Fishbourne Palace. And I think it was the day before his retirement, um, he had declared his retirement or told his principal that he was retiring. He saw a notice in the local newspaper looking for someone um, as an interpreter to work at the museum, this museum that we're standing in. And he has been doing that ever since. So as we, you know, chatted, it was just really nice to talk to him. And he used the Cambridge Latin course as well. So that was fun. In stage 19, I know it's Alexandria, but I couldn't uh, let y'all escape without talking about the cat on the blue book. Okay. So that's in London. That's at the British Museum. And before I go on and show you the cat, let me just talk about the British Museum itself. I didn't realize what a beautiful classical building the British Museum is. Um, I hadn't really ever paid much attention to it until I was actually there. <laughs> it's amazing. Beautiful columns, beautiful grounds. Probably the most crowded site we went to. So here's the Gayer Anderson cat. And you may recognize this from the blue book, the cover of the blue book. He's just as beautiful in person as he is on the book. Um, so 600 BC. And he's called the Gayer Anderson because of the man who owned him and who gave him to the museum eventually. Here he is from the side. I was very interesting to read, and I posted this here so you can read um, later. They think there's actually, they x-rayed him and it turns out he's had all these repairs through the century. And um, so that's what this little slide talks about. I thought that was kind of neat. Something I definitely did not know. And so moving on to stage 21, um, Aquasulis. I'm sure you're thinking, well, this is what everyone's been waiting for because this is the most famous, you know, site here. So um, of course this is, it's located in Bath. <laughs> and I don't know about y'all, but we just finished reading the Cephalus death scene in my Latin two class. So this uh, site, you know, came up a lot. Unfortunately, it was not, I thought I was going to love this site and I really ended up not liking it at all. It was so crowded. It was so noisy it, to the point of it being unpleasant. And um, 
I know that's maybe not realistic of me because it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So, so many people come to visit this site, um, not just for the baths, the Roman baths, but just the buildings around it as well. But it was to the point, it was so crowded that it was hard to read the interpretations on the artifacts. So that's when things got very, you know, sad for me. But at least I got to see the, the curse tablets. So I'm going to focus on the, the wonderful things about it. So this was a less crowded area. Uh, if you do visit, you'll need to remember that this is a multi-layered site, very similar to the Roman um, Forum or you know anything that has centuries of people using it and living in it. Very little of the ancient bath actually remains. So the red lines here indicate the buildings that no longer exist. Unfortunately, the temple is one of them. But the great bath and the sacred spring, you can still see. So just to kind of orient you, this was the town of Bath or Aquasulis. You can imagine King Kagidibnis coming around here to get healed. The temple and the Thermai are right there where the arrow is pointing. This is that famous temple pediment that is featured in so much art. Um, when you go to the museum here, this, this face is everywhere. Uh, you can drink the water here. When you get to the very end of the um, interpretations, the museum, you can go up to this little fountain, get a cup, and actually drink the water. I was very shocked to learn that it was warm. I mean, like, I don't know why. I mean, it is a hot spring, but the water is hot. And so here's my husband trying it. And so, yeah, so that was a really fun experience. I really enjoyed that. But I wanted to show you a much nicer um, Roman bath that I... If you go to England, you cannot miss this place. This was probably hands down my, if not my favorite, my second favorite place that I visited in, um, in England. It's actually in Wales, but this is an amazing place. So this is called the Carlean uh, Roman Baths. And it was a, so a settlement for soldiers that really focused on um, the baths. They had this gigantic swimming pool that you see here, and it's that's not real water. Um, here's one of the most amazing things about this site is their interpretation of it and their the way that they displayed um, the bath. So that's actually white sand that has filled up what used to be the swimming pool. And onto this white sand, they project a video of water and people swimming in it. And if you want to go look at my videos of it, I, I highly recommend that you do. It's, it's just an amazing place. Um, here, you can see the picture of the, um, in the center here of that giant swimming pool. And then here are more pictures of that, that projection. In the background, you can see like that's that area where, where there's a lot of light is where you checked in and, and paid your fee. And then the museum is kind of all the way around the little um, barricaded area there. And you looked down into this beautiful swimming pool. This was something really interesting there. This was one of the drains for the swimming pool. And as you can imagine, when people go swimming and they use a uh, site, they lost things. So one of the most amazing things was the stuff they found in this drain. And you can see the drain there at the bottom right. And these are actually little seal stones that fell out of people's rings and jewelry that they found in, um, in the drain of the swimming pool, which I just thought was really neat. <laughs> There's a swimming pool again. <laughs> I was obsessed with it. So in stage 22, uh, we have the De Ficciones, right? The, um, the curse tablets. And I was really curious about these. These were located at Aquasulis in the museum. 
they were very ignored. Hardly anyone was looking at these, which is why I have decent pictures of them. And I was very curious to see how thick they were. So I took this picture for y'all. You can see they were not very thick at all. They were really quite thin. And of course, these are all um, whack, um, cursed tablets that were found at Aquasulis that were thrown into the baths, into the spring, hoping that whoever the subject of them was would suffer great torment. Stage 25 is where things get really interesting, um, all about soldiers. There are so many wonderful um, sites and museums related to soldiers, dedicated to Roman soldiers in England. Because let's face it, that's, um, you know, they were the main population at the time or in the early parts of Roman, Roman England. So there are two major Roman museums real, uh, dedicated solely to soldiers and the soldier life. One was near the Carlean Baths that I just showed you. So we'll start there. That's the National Roman Legion Museum. So a lot of the things you'll see here, like the, at the phrase at the top is all in Welsh because it is in Wales. Some of the most interesting things I saw at the museum, which if you look beyond this um, glass jar, you'll see a little girl. All the kids who visited the museums wore these little yellow vests um, because most of the time they were walking to the museum from their schools. Again, I was just so thrilled to see that. Um, this was a museum where we got apologized to almost the entire time we were there because the kids were so loud. Um, I didn't find them to be loud. Uh, and of course I was used to kids, so it did not bother me in the least. Um, uh, this museum had a lovely collection of burial, glass burial urns, and you see an example here. Um, here's my hand next to some catapult shot, which I was very interested in. And you can see a little caltrop there on the top left. These were uh, little sharp pieces of metal that the Roman soldiers would use on enemies to hopefully get a horse's hoof or a person's foot stuck on. One of the funniest things about this museum, it's, it's public bathroom has this funny little mural painted to look like a, this, uh, a latrine, a latrina of a Roman fort. So you see that here. <laughs> And on the left, it, it, I mean, you can see the, the toilet is the wooden structure on the bottom left. So I actually sat on that to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I did not film that. Sorry. And just thought it was really cute with the sponge stick and everything. The other Roman army museum is um, this one here. It is in... Northern England on Hadrian's Wall. I loved this um, boot. Uh, one of the wonderful things about um, all these sites is the leather collections in many of the museums. I'm obsessed with those right now. More catapult shot. More leather shoes. The leather at the top is actually from a tent, a soldier's tent. Um, this was an amazing thing too. Um, these little dedicatory altars that we always see, I always imagine them to be much larger, like, you know, I don't know, waist high. They're tiny. Many of them are tiny and you see that here. Next, stage 26 is Agricola. And we all know that Agricola was stationed in Deva, or modern Chester, which is here, one of the largest fortresses in um, ancient Roman Britain. Um, they had an amphitheater here, the little model of it. Most of the amphitheater is underground, but as you can see, they've uncovered some of it here. They did this little mural that you see there in kind of in the middle of the picture.
Some of the remains here. I thought the mural was very nice. Helped you to envision it. Nearby is a lovely little sculpture garden with some ancient remains in it. These are modern um, mosaics, but I thought they were really neat. Stage 27 is all about Roman life in a fort. So I thought I'd show you some pictures of my favorite fort that I went to, which was Housestead's Roman Fort um, on Hadrian's Wall. So the site is up here in like in the middle of this picture. And to get to it, you can see the people on the right are making the half mile hike up to the site from the parking lot. And you see so all these beautiful sheep and this beautiful green meadow. The museum is the building on the left near the trees. Again, I loved seeing the leather with the hobnails in it. This fort has one of the best preserved latrines in all of ancient Britain. So it's nice to see. A hypocost. And this is kind of leading up to um, the part of the wall, uh, part of Hadrian's wall. This is looking out, this is basically, this picture is the northern border of ancient Britannia. So we're pretty much on Hadrian's wall at this point, looking out into the distance, what would have been barbarian land to Romans. Hadrian's Wall here, off in the distance, standing from that vantage point. Um, one of the things that really struck me about this site was how stark it was and beautiful. Um, just an amazing place to visit. I, I could really, I just felt really that I could feel the spirit of the Romans here. Hadrian's Wall, of course, is a walkable path. Uh, many people do walk it, and you see that here. Uh, it is 86 miles long, and many, many, many people uh, walk it every year. This is my plan for the future, eventually. I had a couple of favorite experiences I wanted to share with y'all. Uh, Vindolanda was a probably my favorite place that I visited. Uh, footsteps into the past. Yes, indeed. 2,000 years of history at Vindolanda. Um, an origi originally a fort, but a town that grew up next to it. I don't know why my face is doing that, but this is the, um, the road, the Roman road that ran right through the fort. So I thought that was really neat, having just built a Roman road with my students. It was nice to see a real one. Also to see the Vindolanda writing tablets. And if you don't know, these are tablets that um, people use kind of as everyday correspondence, kind of like a wax tablet, but it, they were actually written on thin sheets of wood, probably bark from a lime tree. And the little holes on the left and right were tied with leather to keep them together. Some of the most interesting um, daily correspondence comes from these. And of course, the shoe collection is unparalleled. Over 4,000 shoes, leather shoes, have been found at Vindolanda. And here's just the, the shoe wall is what people call it at the beginning, uh, at the front of the museum. Some of these just, this is a child's shoe. Little hobnail design that was surely meant to leave behind a decorative track in the dirt. This was one of the most amazing experiences I had. Um, I've been nerding out on Roman leather shoes now for the past few years, and I had um, seen this archaeologist uh, speak on Roman shoes many times via Zoom. I had read articles by her 
all in preparation for a unit that I'll be teaching next year in my Roman technology class on leather shoes. And um, she, of course, is there every summer at Vendolanda um, excavating. And she pulled the shoe out of <laughs> the ground, this 2000 year old uh, Roman leather shoe. And I called out to her. I didn't think she'd, you know, come and talk to me, but she did. Uh, her name is Dr. Elizabeth Green, and uh, she came and chatted with me. We had a nice little conversation. She couldn't believe that I that I knew her work, that I knew who she was. She was very um, she was very happy about that. I was just happy to talk to her. <laughs> and then I also thought I should mention another favorite uh, part of mine, which was Calernum. This is Chester's Roman fort. It, um, this was a um, cavalry fort. So lots of horses here. But the really fun thing about this place was it's the Clayton Museum. And this was an old school antiquarium. And I just love looking at all the little altars dedicatory altars, some of them much larger than others, but you can see some of these tiny ones in the background next to my hand. They were just tiny and that just blew me away. It was like, you know, something you don't realize until you actually see it for yourself. I think Jenny uh, posted the other day, one of these on our Facebook group. Um, this was a little um, leather, leather, uh, metal arm purse. So this is what the Roman soldiers might have worn or under um, on the top part of their arm. And they would keep like little valuables in here, maybe even their pay. And you can see they were adjustable. So I thought that was really neat. It was something I'd never seen. I love these little miniature votives, little arrow and bow. Another favorite of mine was a, a shocker. This was totally free. It was the Queen Hive Mosaic in London. And you can just go walk here. This was installed in 2014. It tells the story of the city of London in mosaic form. And so here we have the first Roman invasion in the 50s. It's supposed to be Boudicca and her sack of London. Here's Hadrian. And all along the bottom of the mosaic, they uh, focused on like wildlife in the area. So you've got the Tinka Tinka fish, some Roman glassware, the cult of Mithras. I just loved walking along this. Um, it was a really neat experience. A couple of big tech takeaways because I know I'm running out of time, but um, were baths. I mean, they were literally everywhere. And one of the things I did not realize is how much they relied on them as city centers, um, places of gathering for people and just to get warm. Uh, you can see that um, these, uh, this part of the hypocost, um, I was not used to seeing them in. in Italian hypocost and Greek hypocost, you see the uh, the columns built up with little tiles. Here, many of them were just made out of solid stone. So I thought that was cool. And then the other takeaway was, was Constantine and Christianity. I didn't get to talk about York, our visit to York, but um, it was interesting. And, you know, I, I did a lot of research before I went on this trip. And one of the podcasts I listened to talked about how, um, you know, Christianity was really what one of the biggest legacies of the Romans in Britain. I had never really thought about that until I heard an expert say that. So that was really interesting to see. Um, as I said here, I've, I've put all of this information in a website that I hope you will use. Um, it's got my itinerary. It's got um, research books and just everything I use to kind of prepare for the trip and all my pictures and all my videos, please use them. That is why I make them. Um, I, I want other people to enjoy them and use them like I do. And I will take any questions you might have. Um, 
because I hope you have some. I hope you enjoyed hearing my whirlwind presentation. Yeah, please feel free to um, unmute yourselves and just ask her anything that comes to mind. <laughs> You know, what an amazing experience you had. And oh, yes. Yeah, so well done. Well, and, but on the other hand, you did a lot of research and preparation for this trip. Yes. Yeah. And there is a, you know, there is another, if you're looking to go to Britain with a group, um, I see that the Virgilian Society has a trip coming up this summer. I think it's in July and they are going to England. So, you know, that would be a good opportunity. I noticed that they are using public transportation though, to get around, which I thought that's interesting. They're probably trying to save money because I'm sure getting a coach for, you know, an extended amount of time is a lot of money, but I'm curious to see how things will go if there is a strike because we noticed it happening a lot. <laughs> So my trip was, we did 16 days. So two days for travel and 14 full travel days. There were some days where we did three to four sites. We got around with a car. Yeah. And, and England is really not so small, you know. Yeah. And if you're on a tour with another group, that's just going to slow things down considerably. Very true. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, that was just fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing all of that with us this evening. Um, yeah. And I hope all of you will take Natalie up on her offer and, uh, and use some of this material and some of her slides. I just think that this is, this just opens up a whole new world to your students when you can actually show them these things that are still there and they're just not looking at pictures in a book. Yeah, there's the site again. And I will also post my slides here real quick before I go, in case you want those as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording, but if there is anyone who